नमस्कार डियर ऑल वील बी स्टार्टिंग विद द सेशन्स ऑन इंडियन फाइनेंशियल मॉडल्स आई रियली थैंक श्री एस गुरुमूर्ति जी बिकॉज ही इज कमिंग हियर फ्रॉम ऑल द वे फ्रॉम चेन्नई एंड वी आर रियली फॉर्चुनेट टू हैव हिम फॉर द थर्ड टाइम एंड इट इज आई रियली कंसिडर इट एज अ ब्लेसिंग दैट ही हैज चोजन टू गिव अस टाइम and he has to travel all the way from chennai but he has been doing it regularly for this is the third batch actually the course on indian financial models is really a new course i don't think in any of the academic institutions such course is being offered so i don't want to take more time i think he will be able to tell really the background of the course and what will we all gain from uh, attending the course Uh, i take it my honor to introduce him sir please come to the on the dais <laughs> shri swaminathan gurumurthi ji very famous is known as s gurumurthi and he has been very well known for his investigative writings especially he has he was one of the persons who could really unearth many frauds related to whether it is reliance industries or whether it is related to bofors and for last several years he is writing not only on finance but also on various topics related to economics and law he is a distinguished professor of research in legal anthropology in shastra university and he has done a good amount of research on the topic which we will be discussing here that is on indian financial models uh, business baron magazine has rated him his knowledge of economics finance and accounts as outstanding he has many such credits which i don't want to really take more time and i would request him to start friends is it working i am extremely happy to be here for the third time and more importantly i wanted to congratulate the iit bombay this is jom school of management to have dared to start this course because this is not a course based on textbooks maybe after a few years it can create a textbook in fact as i was telling dr bapet iit should be producing textbooks should not be following them but unfortunately we are all following textbooks because it is easier way of handling subjects and passing examinations but we have a much bigger and greater responsibilities because we are one of those high end educational institutions which is supposed to be leading the other leading educational institutions it is with that uh, purpose and responsibility that i thought that i would share my thoughts with you you know there is a background to this course and i must explain that background because most of you are new i understand because uh, every year the uh, batches change so maybe it has to be repeated as to why this course you know in 1991 there was a tsunami in indian economy that is the tsunami of globalization see many of you may not have been aware of the velocity and the viciousness with which globalization hit india of course we invited those problems also because of the very faulty approach to indian economy but the fact remains the assumptions on which globalization was being promoted at that time which has now been proved to be completely false untenable unsustainable unworkable in future at that time the assumptions on which globalization was being driven and directed completely shook all countries which were not 
quote unquote within the range of market economics. Of course, the term market economics itself has different meanings in different countries. The Anglo-Saxon market economics which is financial economics is not something which is accepted in continental Europe for instance and the break came in 2010 about which I will tell you later as to how the western countries began fighting with one another as to how your market model of economics will not suit me. So, you can understand there is nothing like one homogeneous or uh, broadly acceptable or unified market theory of economics. As we go forward, we will explore together how this entire concept of market economics is so confusing today. The central theories which drove this market economics themselves have lost their validity. So, today market economics has absolutely no theoretical basis which we will see later, but to tell you at that time there is something like a bible of globalization written by Francis Fukuyama. end of history and last man. I do not know whether any of you have heard about this book and the last man. Any of you heard this book? In this book Francis Fukuyama said after the collapse of the communist order the western market capitalism and liberal democracy which constituted the core of the western civilization have emerged as the victorious and the west has emerged as the best and it is best for the rest to follow the west. That was the simple theoretical formulation which Francis Fukuyama gave. He said the world was always run by conflicts, wars, ideological wars previously religious wars, then commercial wars, now there will be no war because everybody will accept the same theory, same principle, same market, same way, same theories and so all the clashes have stopped. With the collapse of the communist order, the challenge to the west has abated. So, hereafter there is going to be no clash. And so, that is the end of history. History is full of clashes and so this is going to end hereafter and the way human beings were fighting that kind of human phenomenon will end and this became the bible of globalization. But what happened in the year 1994 he wrote a book called trust the same man. Within two years he revised his opinion and was acclaimed as the greatest exposition of market economics, the theoretical foundation of market economics. But in this he distinguished between family based societies which I will come to later, but you note for the moment and individualist societies. I will come to later, but in two years he revised his opinion, but still this was the foundation on which the entire idea of globalization was being driven. And in fact, somebody commented his second book constituted, the first book constituted end of history and the second book constituted end of economics. That is how they commented very derisively on that, but this book is an important book in the context of what I am going to tell you in the coming weeks. So, the tsunami of globalization which hit India, at that time the media, political parties, bureaucracy, economists, intellectuals who were all advocating the socialist model of development till day before yesterday wholesale defected to the other side and there was no one to say whether the direction in which we are going or leaping into something without understanding whether it is going to be useful or useless, how risky it is, absolutely everything was forgotten because Russia had given it up, East European countries have given it up and so we have also to give it up. 
the direction in which the world is going we will not be able to resist and so we take up the same model as was being suggested by the west for the rest and even other western countries like continental west like germany or france or italy or spain they had to accept it it was actually as i will explain to you later the anglo saxon model the word anglo saxon model came into being in the dictionary of economics in 2010 april on the 1st when the g20 met and at that time france and germany took the position this anglo saxon model of financial capitalism will not work and we are not going to accept it so this crisis was brewing in the west but nobody had the guts to oppose it because of the way america had emerged as a very powerful unipolar power before that the world was bipolar the socialist and the capitalist block it is not only warring economics it was actually warring group on the ground whether it is vietnam war or korean war wherever you go you could find an afghan war so it became not only clashing economic ideologies they became clashing geopolitical ideology also so when the socialist block evaporated just disappeared capitalist block became the unipolar driver of not only geopolitics but economics also with the result there was no alternative economic thinking available anywhere in fact no one had the guts to talk about an alternative and everybody said this is the only way that is how after francis fukuyama wrote that book the capitalist order emerged as the only way for the world unless we understand this background we will not be able to have a grasp of what we are going to discuss the second point is a totally confused india it was at that time people like me got involved in the act there was total confusion in india at that time the indian political system had also become weakened because rajiv gandhi who had won with 404 members in parliament in 1984 he crashed to 200 in 1989 and narsimha rao became the prime minister with less than a majority needed and he was dependent on allies and so a weakened india a confused india an economically uh, weak not only weakened almost on the verge of bankruptcy external bankruptcy with the growth rate almost having touched zero it was at that time we had also no option but to follow the way of the world if russia did it if east european countries did it if china had started doing it even before these were all clichés what they were doing also we didn't analyze we just accepted as if they are following the rest of the uh, west or led by america we started saying that we will do it at that time people like me and some people who were working with me we thought that we were taking a leap in the dark without knowing the depth of the risk involved and we think that economics is just theory it has much more to do with the people their way of life and their approach to life their way of handling money their savings model investment model expenditure model differ from civilization to civilization culture to culture and how is it the same economic theory will work so this is something which requires introspection and rethinking that is how some of us started traveling across the country to find out the opinion of important people intellectuals economists policy makers business people and we found there was a total confusion and no one was venturing out to suggest anything different from whatever was in the public domain and the public discourse was being driven by where the world was being no slid by the west and in india 
manufacturers were being told by our bureaucrats you know you don't uh, manufacturing is not uh, an indian uh, function we are good traders so let us sell all manufacturing units and begin trading now we are being told even trading is we are no good and let us hand it over to somebody else at that time people like uh, tatas were being told by foreign consultants it is much better that you sell off your manufacturing units you know vehicle manufacturing is a huge uh, global issue we need global brand we need global capital steel is like that chemicals is like that the only industry in which you can operate and be successful in your operation is tcs so you please disinvest in others this was the confusion i am a friend and advisor of many corporates whenever they shared these thoughts with me i was shaken what will happen to this country this is a country which is one sixth of humanity and how can this country give up manufacturing and go for trading services how can it provide sanitation service to the whole country whole world and survive these were all being suggested you can take over the sanitation and municipal services of uh, uh, places like new york and all that here you have so many chamars and you can send them there this is the kind of arguments which were being advanced at that time so some of us started traveling across the country we had two kinds of travels one was business related travel business trade another is educational institutions i started with ludhiana batala jalandhar rajkot jamnagar morbi right down to thootukudi i personally went to about 42 industrial clusters a team of chartered accountants and a professor kanaka sabapati whose book has been recommended to you we all started traveling across the country to find out whether what is the economic strength of india what is its capacity to face up to the uh, world economic forces do we have such competence when we went there we found something totally different operating on the ground contrary to what is being projected when we went to ludhiana we were stunned that ludhiana is a place of machine tools where the world cycle manufacturers source their spare parts requirements and there was no engineering college which produced that talent we have become the largest cycle manufacturer in the world due to the skill of the blacksmith community in ludhiana called ram gadias i don't know whether any of you are from punjab you will know what i am saying we were shocked that this is not what will appear in economic times or business line or uh, business today the hidden skill competence manufacturing strength of india it will not come out and ludhiana has nothing to do with stock market except maybe through one hero honda otherwise they have nothing to do with stock market the understanding of macro economics is through stock market or through gdp these measurements do not touch these people so and i went to jalandhar jalandhar is a place of carpentry and they were not making wooden tables and chairs they were making cricket bats you know as well in cricket control board the uh, english cricket control board south african cricket control board all purchase their bats willows only from jalandhar and when i went there it was small shops sir the entire australian cricket control board purchases cricket bats from me the man doesn't know english and the man who makes the willow is a carpenter in those days he was driving a maruti 800 car which was available to only executives in many companies it was opening my eyes then i went to rajkot 
Rajkot is a center which is a desert, and there is prosperity which has bloomed in that place. And the Raj Rajkot Industries Association president and me, we had a discussion till two o'clock in the morning, and I found he doesn't know a word of English, and I didn't know a word of Gujarati, and we were conversing through a, an interpreter. He told me that in the year 1954 or 55. Uh, blacksmith Patel, he imported a diesel equipment by reverse engineering replicated it and now there are 55 such assembling units. At that time in 1993, 1994 uh, about 2500 ancillary units and they were exporting spare parts and servicing Kirloskar Cummins and they were exporting uh, diesel engines to Saudi Arabia alone for 85 crores in 1980, uh, 1994, everywhere. Then I went to Morbi. We found that the highest per capita income in India is not in Bombay, not in Delhi, not in Chennai, not in Hyderabad, not in Bangalore, it is in Morbi which was devastated by a dam burst in 1966 and in 2001, later to the time I visited, it was devastated by an earthquake. You know the total population of that place is 4 lakhs, 2 lakh people were employed, fullest employment nowhere in the world. They manufacture wall clocks. Places after places when I went there. I found something very different happening in this country about which there is no understanding. Policy makers do not understand, politicians do not understand, ministers do not understand. By the time a different government came to power in 1998, some people known to me were in power. So, I told them about the problems that uh, Thirupur knitwear manufacturers were placing. Thirupur is a place where today they are posting an export turnover of 3 billion dollars. It has no airport. It just has now only a four lane road has been laid. And uh, it has no uh, city facilities worth the name. Now only they have made public private partnership arrangement for water supply and sewerage. No municipal services. At the time they were posting an export turnover 1.2 billion dollars. So, I was speaking, speaking to the finance minister and told him that this is what he said, bar bar aap kar rahe hai, Thirupur mein kya ho raha hai? I told him this is what is happening. Right down to Virudhanagar, Shivakashi, I found a huge amount of uneducated entrepreneurship emerging in this country through backward car, scheduled car, scheduled tribe which has nothing to do with IITs, IIMs and they are driving the manufacturing of India. In Tripur, cotton growers became cotton ginners, they became spinners, they became weavers and they became knitters. There is a book written by one Chari of Boston Consulting, that book I will send the reference to you, Fraternal Capital. That is the title of the book. This book came out in 2002, 2001. 67 percent of the exporters, exporting knitwear is a global level business. It is a global level technology. You have to comply with environmental norms of the West for you to export. 67 percent of them are educated less than 10th standard. Only 7, 8 percent were graduates. There are 300 knitwear exporters. Then I found something very different which is not over the surface, it is happening subterranean under the surface and my confidence in the Indian economy grew. I found a huge amount of uneducated entrepreneurs employing almost all the educated employee, uh, educated persons in India. My mind completely went into a spin. 
So naturally I thought that the way the public discourse is going on is deceiving the people. Questions arose in my mind, who will build India? What will build India? And which is the model? Only Indians can build India. The very reason is very simple. You know, when we started liberalizing and globalizing, out of the GDP, 12 percent was corporate. Today it is 14 to 15 percent. Today, this is 1991, this is 2000. 13. At that time, we had 74 lakh people employed in private sector. Today, it is 104 lakhs, just an addition of 30 lakhs. That is all. This is about the IT business, great manufacturing, automobiles, all put together. Where does employment in India come from? In 2005, there was an economic census which said there are 43.2 million non farming enterprises employing 102 million people. This is the largest employer, and 75 percent of it is unregistered. That is the entrepreneur building model. They are the barriers and servers in hotels. After 10 years, they establish a small hotel. 20 years, they establish a big hotel. The same thing is happening in construction industry. The same thing is happening in trade. So, there is a divergence between educational institutions or our understanding, theoretical understanding of Indian economy and what is happening on the ground. Today, you look at what is the GDP composition of India. Government is 21 percent, corporate 15 percent, agriculture 16 to 17 percent, then balance is non corporate sector, which is about 47 percent is non corporate sector. This is after liberalization and globalization. So, when we were looking at what was happening at that time, we knew that people who will build India will be Indians and not multinational companies. Multinational companies can add value to India, they can be additives, they cannot be the core. Even large industries cannot be the core. Even in Japan, they, China, they are not the core. Even in Japan, they are not the core. You know what is the difference between General Motors and Mitsubishi? Mitsubishi consists of 32,000 small scale units, pyramided into Mitsubishi brand. Everything is, this Mitsubishi will network through what is known as the Keiretsu model. Previously, it was called Zebetsu. Zebetsus were broken by the Americans after Japan was taken over. So, every country has developed its own model of employment, how to distribute money, how to distribute opportunities, how to promote entrepreneurship. So, this became the core attention in our mind. So, with the result, for this 43.2 million non farming enterprises, capital from organized sources today is just 5 percent. The balance comes from private sources, relatives, friends, communities, local money lenders. 
they provide employment for 102 million people, huh? 10 crore people. So, all this was opening my mind that if India is to grow, it will not go, go grow by a top down model, it will be by a bottom upwards model and that is so many great manufacturers in India. The person who established the MRF factory was selling balloon in Marina Beach in 1942. None of you from IIT will go and establish a tire factory, you will get employed. You must understand entrepreneurship is a very, very different issue. It calls for a very different way of approach to life. Then I found that entrepreneurship in India, at that time India had not entered into global entrepreneur monetary study in the year 2002 only they did it. At that time when we were travelling across the country and seeing this entrepreneur movement taking place, it was not just entrepreneurs here and there, it is a movement. 43.2 million means four and a half crores entrepreneurs and it is only opportunities which exist at a particular place and a person's inclination to take risk, go and coin his connections in the society, put his skill to work that makes him one of these entrepreneurs. So, the economic model that was operating in India was something very different. So, we found it will be built by Indians on domestic capital and what is the model? This is not the American model. In fact, you may talk to any of these uh, fund managers, they are surprised by one, one particular aspect of the Indian uh, entrepreneurs. They say they do not want to grow beyond a certain point. In most western countries, particularly the Anglo-Saxon countries, people who have a certain growth, they multiply, multiply, multiply and become huge, but here people do not want. That enables manufacturers to grow in different places, not one manufacturer in all places. People want to be in their home, people want to be in their place of language, people want to be in their place of culture, people want to be in the place where their gods are located. A very, they have a different life model promoting a very different economic model. All this was being revealed to me and to our team, part of which has come in the form of the research which has been put into the textbook by Kanak Sapapati. And in 2002, the Global Entrepreneur Monitor study confirmed this. They said, out of in the age group of 15 to 64, all this I will tell you later, with, I am just you take the figures for granted at the moment. Indians 18 percent are entrepreneurs, 11 percent China, 10 percent US. So, it is a global entrepreneur monitor study which declared India as an entrepreneur led economy. Afterwards, only the world began to wake up to entrepreneurial talent of India. Then political changes came in India. India was always a subdued nation. If some Americans came, our people used to stand up. When we went there, they would not offer us a seat. No, this was the kind of, you are a, an also ran country. You are not a powerful country. You know, in 1971, when Kissinger went to China, he waited to meet Masetung for three days. He was not sure whether he would give appointment or not. At that time, China's GDP was less than that of India and their per capita income was 60 percent of India's. And between 1957 and 60, in that great leap forward movement, 3 crore people Chinese died of hunger. 
the news itself came out only in 1978 because they suppressed the news only in a democracy such news will come that was amartya sen got nobel prize amartya sen compared india and china and said in india if there is one hunger death in kalahandi the parliament will stop passenger trains will be converted into goods trains for food to be moved there because there was no democracy 3 crore people died and the news came out after 20 years that was the state of china but why did kissinger go there and beg for appointment because they had atom bomb this is what the indian system learned the poker and blast of 1998 was a great geopolitical paradigm shift for india all the economic advantages india derived later attention from america you know when india exploded the atom bomb bill clinton made a statement so what a great country it is it is a country of buddha it is a country of gandhi they have done this we were always a country of gandhi we were always a country of buddha but you are not giving us a seat to sit but the moment we exploded this see how our respect went up because in a world of rogues you have to be a rogue that is the lesson geopolitical lesson a country which doesn't have this physical power will never be respected japan japan is considered to be an important country they may have money who is bother about them they don't have even a platoon of soldiers dollars to the americans to take care of their defenses that is the condition america imposed you should not have a regular army we must know world is driven by power and the power is not just economic power as i said in 1971 china had no economic power they had atomic power so when pokhran was exploded the world came down on india with sanctions financial sanctions technology sanctions at the time the government of india took a measure because we have to study the psychology of how the world looks at what a nation does in a crisis in a crisis do you go about begging or do you do something different the government appealed to the non resident indians please we are in a state of crisis the whole world is out to finish us we want 5 billion dollars so they issued the india development bond at that time no one would trust india with 1 dollar because india would pay it back in terms of dollar or not was not known the non resident indians gave 6.2 billion dollars that shook the world you know why in 1998 when the pokhran atom bomb was exploded an advertisement specialist i forget her name if any of you can because the previous class i have mentioned her name she wrote an article she said whenever i had gone abroad she always used to stay in houses because being brought up in a certain traditional household she never used to stay in hotels she said whenever i used to stay in this a non resident indian houses they always used to abuse india as a rotten country as a dirty country as a useless country as a corrupt country see the traffic she said all this changed on 11th may 1998 that became deepavali day for them you know why you were having such inferiority complex that when this atom bomb was exploded they celebrated it because they began to be respected only then till then nobody respected our nris the sound of the atom won their respect and won for india 6.2 billion dollars afterwards this country never turned back this is a very very important point any research into national psychology motivation making the people partners in the development and 
take risk on behalf of the country this event will, will rank as one of the most important thing but in india a research like this will never be done in other countries it will happen in india why it will not happen i am going to read out uh, tarasina sorry tarasina where is can you get me the mobile phone so india began rising geopolitically we began to handle geopolitics from that date till then we never handled geopolitics then world began seeing india as a serious player it's no more what no 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 it was not a nuclear bomb actually hydrogen bomb was tested only in 1978 yes 1998 before that it was not a hydrogen bomb and of course we had developed missiles in the meanwhile you were you were not a nuclear power then this is this is almost, you can ask any expert there is no issue 1974 bomb explosion no that was not considered to be a bomb it was no hydrogen bomb okay so this is this meant the geopolitical rise of india and in the year 2004 5 india began rising and posted 8.5% gdp growth india arrived this is a very very important development but at the time another development took place which is less noticed in this country the world bank and imf who are always recommending what was known as the washington consensus and full scale financial liberalization they found crisis after crisis was hitting the developing nations and not allowing them to develop they said there is no single model for the world there is no whole all model for the world every country has to develop its own model this is one suggestion they gave to the world deviating from their position in from 1971 this happened in 2005 which they reiterated in 2010 later that i will come to i am only giving you an overview of the background to where we are why this classes are being taken for which i am giving you this overview then came the 2008 financial meltdown as we will see later this completely shook the west the west did not know how this crisis came the man who led the world economy alan greenspan who was the chairman of the us federal reserve system he said i don't know nobel prize was given for economic theories which i followed i never thought nobel prize theories could be wrong and computer could be wrong human judgment was handed over to computer whether to buy a share or to sell the share to fix the values of currency everything was done on mathematical model people were simply sitting and watching what was happening and that led to a crisis it completely crashed many economic theories which were trotted out by the laboratories of economics in the west in what is known as the uh, fresh water and salt water uh, thinking groups of america ultimately the economic meltdown about which i will explain to you later completely shook the foundations of modern economics something which is not fully appreciated even partially appreciated not even discussed in india that's a very very important thing which we will be dealing with in the course of our next thing is the avenues program these are all macros happening in the country now i am coming to iit avenues program 2010 where i was invited to address the iit inaugural uh, address by dr bapat i don't know why he chose me but i was chosen 
and ahead of me was Mr. Adi Godrej. You see, his presentation was the normal presentation of the intelligentsia in India. That India were always underperforming in economics. They were great spiritualists, moralists, and they knew about nature. They knew about everything, art, music, culture, but they did not know about economics. We did not know the value of money. We did not know how to make money. We did not know how to enjoy life. We did not know how to have better standard of living. It is only when globalization and liberalization policies came to be adopted from 1992-93, we began growing, we began to have better standard of living, we began to have better cars, we began to have better air conditioners and so we must thank the world for what we are today. You know the entire IIT research scholars, students and faculty stood up and clapped when Mr. Godrej completed his speech and I was to speak next. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you put yourself in that position, a whole civilization has been humiliated and I have to speak afterwards. <laughs> then I explained how it is completely wrong without of course meaning any offense to Mr. Godrej that all that Mr. Godrej spoke was valid only till 1978. This is very important date for India. It was proved to be wrong in 1983, confirmed to be wrong in 2001. 1978, you know Dr. Rajkrishna was an economic advisor to government of India, a socialist economic thinker. He had been advising government of India and so somebody asked him a question. Gentlemen, you have been advising uh, the economists uh, or economic policies of the government. You see, Russia is there, East European countries are there, Yugoslavia is there. They are also following the same policies which you have prescribed for India, but they are growing fast. Where are we not growing? Then I do not know, maybe the man wanted to escape. Why? We are not growing and he said, no, 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 we cannot achieve socialist rate of growth, we can achieve only Hindu rate of growth. It was an aside, no thought. Why he said it, there is no historic research behind it. This was taken by Robert McNamara, who was the president of the World Bank at that time. He addressed at least five world conferences. Here is an admission by an Indian policy maker and an economic economist that India can never grow on its own. It will always need aid. So, I am begging aid for India from you. That is how it became the brand of India. Even two years back, I think in a lecture in IIT Bombay, Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia mentioned this. to be completely wrong in 1983 by Paul Bayrock, a Belgian economist who studied the world economy from 1750 to 1900. He said in this period, in 1750, China and India, China was 34 percent of world GDP. India was 24.5 percent, US, UK put together 2 percent. In 1750, in 1900, this rises to 41 percent, both of them put together fall to 8 percent. India 1.8 percent. China 6.2 percent, they shook the West. How could it be that in 1750 that we did not have that kind of standard of living which Asia had? This issue of 1978 that India could not grow, that India was the second leading economic power of the world after China was established 
by Paul Bayrock, one of the greatest economic historians of that time. Then I am, I am only going to give you a glimpse, we will go into it later. And then the OECD countries constituted a research under Angus Madison. Development Studies Institute were the research name. Development Studies Institute. They gave him a platoon of assistants, sociologists, historians, statisticians, economists to check whether what Paul Bayrock said is correct or not. Angus Madison postulated, in fact I will deal with it later and you will just for your satisfaction, I will say what Angus Madison said before he started the research. If Bayrock is right, this is what Angus Madison said before he started the research. If Bayrock is right, then much more of the backwardness of the third world, we are. They gave up the word third world much later because all of us said, no, do not call us third world. Backwardness of the third world presumably has to be explained by colonial exploitation and much less of Europe's advantage can be due to scientific precocity, centuries of slow accumulation and organizational financial superiority. This way he started. Then he came out with the finding for 2000 years. In the first year of the common era, Angus Madison said, India 34 percent of world GDP, 1000, India first, China second, 1400, same, 1500, both equal, 1600, China ahead, 1700, India ahead. The game was between these two countries, others were not even on the scoreboard. When I mentioned this, the IIT did not know about it. This research was completed in the year 2001 and it is a OECD's finance funded research. It is there in the website of OECD, I am not getting into other things like the Egyptian Roman parliamentary record or uh, uh, Marco Polo's travelogue or the 1934 uh, Bank of International Settlements, I will come to it later. All these are supporting materials. India was a highly performing nation. No one knew about it. After I completed this, of course, I shared with them my experiences of traveling across the country and how this economic potentialities, propensities, competence is still working at the grassroots level. Then many students and Dr. Bapad, everybody came to me and said, Mr. Guru Murthy, do not stop with this lecture, please take a course for us. That is so, we are conducting the course for the third time. So, there is a basic drive and the drive is to understand India. In my whole experience of dealing with the academic institutions, policy makers, media, I have been part of the media, I found there is not even a willingness to understand India. And maybe others are interested in understanding India. When I was addressing the administrative staff college in Hyderabad, in 1995 or 94 and when I explained that India can grow and it can grow only on the strength of Indians, Indian competence, Indian capital. One person, one professor stood up and said people like you must be shot dead Mr. Gurumurthy, you are preventing the rise of India. That was the kind of opposition we were facing for expressing an alternative view. It is not that we are making policies or forming governments. We are just asking you to listen to an alternative voice, forbidden. 
before 1991 anybody talking against socialism was considered to be a cia agent after 1991 if anybody spoke against globalization liberalization baba you have to understand whether these policies would suit us whether culture our tradition our family system you are considered to be a person who will take the country 1500 years back this was the kind of intellectual oppression against anyone who extra who try to express an alternative view point four things became very very clear to me and that is the basis on which i began to do my further work the strength of the indian economy is the strength of middle india and not urban india the urban india is largely the overheads of the indian economy the second point is the drive of india is domestic it's not external i i actually wrote the whole thing as a manuscript which i was prevented from publishing by my own colleagues who said some of the ideas which you have expressed like for instance i had said caste is not the curse caste is actually the social capital of india they said don't express this view because mandalization is going on now but it has been proved today the caste is actually the vehicle for entrepreneurship caste and economics produces entrepreneurship caste and politics produces chaos so there is you can't cultivate relationship between the people it naturally inheres and that is why you find patels developing ramgadi has developing in ramanagara you go how uh, people develop as a community the entire western tamil nadu the kungu gounder community five districts account for 60% of tamil nadu gdp the nadar community accounts for 75% of the retail trade and 90% of the wholesale trade purely communities based relationship the same is happening in germany is happening in japan is happening in korea so we formulated caste is social capital and not a social curse if it is properly engaged and it happens on its own on which a harvard study has come about which i will refer to you later and then india will be savings driven and domestic capital driven and it will not be export driven uh, uh, it will not be fdi driven and that has been proved now between 1991 and 2011 the amount of savings investment gap is 1.2% 99.8% of the funding of indian economy has come from domestic sources these are all facts which were not discussed only shankaracharya who was the advisor to the government till 2007 he wrote an article in 2010 that is surprising that of all the emerging economies India is the only country which is not dependent on FDI for growth. We needed FDI only to finance our imports, not for our growth. I will go into it later. So the basic, this is the background in which an alternative thinking has to be generated in mainline academic institutions. I address public meetings, write articles, go and talk to policy makers. but some academic institution must get into it and do something original you are the only people who can do research you are the only people who can come out with studies otherwise it will be empirical all my studies are empirical empirical studies have no value in india because it has no value abroad that's the point it is not that empirical studies have no meaning you know the entire japanese economy developed on the base of empirical skills and not formal skills in the year 
the United Nations asked the Japanese Institute of Development Studies to produce a document on how Japan from being a, an importer of technologies became an exporter of technology. They produced 20 volumes, 11 of which were translated into English and I have read the first volume. I can bring it in one of the classes and read out only one paragraph out of it, in which they say that we had no engineering colleges to produce growth. He just tabulated the empirical talent we had in terms of masons, in terms of carpenters, in terms of mechanics and we found that for our textile industry which we wanted as one of the growth agents of Japan, our spinning technology was inferior as compared to India and was not matching our weaving technology. So, we imported the spinning technology from India, they did not start a textile uh, training college. This is the top down model. No country has developed other than America because they had no original society. They had a new society. So, everything had to be newly done. There was no 4000, 5000 year old way of life, carpentry, masonry. So, that model became the global model. Unfortunately, that became the accepted model because of the way we are persuaded to think being uh, very articulate speakers and lovers of English. English education did one great damage to India. Instead of understanding the world for India, the English educated Indian began to think that he is superior to other Indians who did not know English. This created an intellectual divide between performers and you go to uh, Rajkot as I tell you nobody will understand English or in Karur or in Namakkal. You know Karur is a place where we went, we were stung. There are two huge banks produced in that place, Karur Vaisya Bank and Lakshmi Vilas Bank, each with a deposit base of 40 to 50,000 crores. The total population of the place is 7 and a half lakhs now. Did anyone do a research as to how such a small town could produce such huge banks? When did this financial entrepreneurship come from? So, we found that there is no connect between high end educational institutions and the society which was a performing society. So, I thought that we must do something and it is in this context we have now uh, constituted a small group which have begun doing this work, but this kind of work being out, done outside uh, a formal high end educational institution will take a very long time for it to manifest. You know one China, he was an inventor of the theory that scale of production, economies of scale is not applicable to agriculture, this is what he said in 1928. So, he said do not touch agriculture, do not regard it as industry, do not regard it as an economic vocation, take it as culture. This is what he told Lenin, he was put in jail. In 1938, Stalin brought him out on the 2nd of October 1938, he shot him dead. In 1984, the western thinkers translated China's works and found he was right. In the year 2001, the world agreed that scale of economies are not applicable to agriculture. You know today we have 41 percent of the land under cultivation by 98 million small and marginal farmers producing 51 percent of India's food grains. If a mainline educational institution in Russia had taken up China's work, this would not have happened. So, it is necessary that mainline institutions are woken up to this different reality functioning in India. That is why I said that if you ask me to run a course 
I will run a course like this, the Indian financial and management model and business financial and management model will constitute the economic model also and I will be in the course of my uh, lectures in the coming few weeks covering the entire gamut of a paradigm difference in the economic model itself which is functioning in India. And I am sure that in the, like in the last uh, two uh, year, I will have few students taking interest in it and doing further work and that is precisely why I am coming from Chennai every week uh, because I am searching for people who will get interested in this. It is not that I have anything other than this to gain, this is precisely what I want to gain and I would implore you to look at it not just as a class. I do not know what it constitutes in terms of academic uh, return to you, but I am expecting a huge national return from you and uh, in the coming few weeks we will explore this matter further. Thank you very much. Only one thing I wanted this, uh, there is an article today which has appeared in uh, Telegraph about uh, a Keralite doing research as to how the entire calculus theories were exported from Kerala. And he said why I, I will forward it to you because it is a huge article and all of you should read it. I will send it to Mr. Bappard and he can forward it to you. And he said unfortunately Indians do not believe that they had exported mathematics. And whenever he spoke, to, he is a professor in London, whenever he spoke abroad the foreigners listened to him, the Indians were careless. He said he said it is something, it is a huge national problem. You know Bodhayana was the person who was ahead of Pythagoras that has been admitted by the world. But what is the research in India? So, we refuse to think that we could have been great. So, I will send this article that is the psychology which we have to overcome, psychological hazard, a barrier to your performance. We can never perform unless you believe that you were performing in the past. Thank you so much. Any questions? Please come ahead because there is recording on. So, come little ahead and ask a question. Anyone else wants to ask? Please come ahead. Sir, uh, just wanted to find out uh, the last thing which we discussed basically uh, economic of scale cannot be applied on agriculture. But uh, whereas in India we see because of the, uh, I would say, uh, microstructure where people have smaller farms, one acre of two, five acre kind of things compared to where in West we see people have larger farms which are as big as 100 acres. The farming is much more easier because technology can be used and you know, so how come economic of scale is, uh, is it only the social structure which we are talking here or is it farming by itself which uh, cannot be taken see up? See there are two reasons why economics of scale is not applicable to agriculture. One, seed is common not somebody does not get a better seed because he cultivated a larger farm. So, once there is efficient seed, it can grow in 2 acre farm as well as in 200 acre farm. The second thing is improved implements are being used even by small farmers by collectivizing for example, they are hiring tractors. So, labor saving devices which are used in larger farming is also being used by small farm. This is one of the explanations given by the uh, planning commission. The planning commission in its report, uh, no, sorry, uh, planning commission's testimony to the Rajya Sabha report in 2007. Last time I distributed it, I will send it to you. In that they have said small and marginal farming is going to be eternal part of India and they are going to be increasingly under trouble, but they are the most efficient. In fact, it is said the Kurmi 
community people cultivate one, one acre, two acres and the jat people cultivate 15 acres and 20 acres. The kurmi farming is more efficient than jat farming. This is a very, uh, it, it is said very derisively, but it is true. All over the world, in 2001 it has been concluded by research, agriculture requires intense personal attention. In fact, you cannot have agriculture by a distant management and so the small farms are more efficient. In fact, that is my objection to as I will tell you later, why I am opposing the food bill of India, this food security bill, because it is going to supply free food grains, almost free food grains to people who are producing food grains. Why will they produce? They will produce something else. So, this is, I wrote three articles in business line that you are cutting at the root of Indian agriculture because small farmers contribute 50 percent of India's grain production. Do not supply free food grains to them. So, can not there be a uh, cooperative kind of a structure? No, the no, ground? this all failed all over the world. Nobody wants to be cooperative are all ideal. People can cooperative market products, can't produce products. Agriculture, we are not a weak country, do not worry about it, but there is a problem with agriculture because agricultural financing, the kind of money that they are getting, the time in which they are getting, the interest at which they are getting, the terms on which they are getting is not good. See, as you are industrializing, agriculture will become an uneconomic operation. It is a fact in all countries, that is why they are subsidizing it very heavily. All industrialized nations subsidize agriculture because agriculture becomes a weak occupation. So, but you cannot do away with agriculture and so you have to subsidize it. Okay. Thank you very much. Ma